This is a reading from the poem of the Man God by Maria Valtorta, ep uh, Volume Five, Episode Five Hundred Ninety Six, the Thursday before Passover, preparation for the supper, and the announcement of the glorification through death. It was written on the third of April, nineteen forty-seven. It is morning again, so serene, so joyful. Even the rare clouds that yesterday were wandering slowly in the cobalt blue sky are no longer there. Neither is there the heavy sultriness that was so oppressive yesterday. A light breeze blows gently on people's faces, and it carries the scent of flowers, of hay, of pure air, and it gently moves the leaves of the olive trees. It seems anxious to let people admire the silver shade of the small lanceolate leaves, to shed tiny white-scented flowers on the steps of Christ, on his fair-haired head, to kiss him, to refresh him, because each tiny calyx has its very small dewdrop, to kiss him, to refresh him, then die before seeing the impending horror and the grass on the hillocks bows, shaking the bell flowers, the corollas, the little palms of thousands of flowers, the large wild ox-eye daisies, stars with golden hearts, are standing high up on their stems as if, as if to kiss the hand that will soon be pierced, and the small daisies and the wild chamomile kiss his generous feet, which will stop walking for the good of men only when they are nailed to give an even greater good, and the bri briar roses smell sweetly, and the hawthorn, which no longer has any flowers, moves its indented leaves. It seems to be saying no, no to those who will use it to torture the Redeemer. And no, say the reeds of the Kidron. They do not want to strike either. And the will of little things does not want to harm the Lord. And perhaps also the stones on the slopes are happy to be out of town in the olive grove, because being there they will not hurt the martyr. And the thin rosy convolvuli, which Jesus loved so much, are weeping, as well as the corums of the snow-white acacias, similar to clusters of butterflies pressing against one stem. Perhaps they are thinking, we shall never see him again. And the myosotes, so slender and pure, drop their corollas when touched by the purple mantle that Jesus is wearing. It must be beautiful to die, being struck by something that belongs to Jesus. All the flowers, also a lost lily of the valley, which perhaps fell there by accident and came up among the protruding roots of an olive tree, is happy to be seen and picked by Thomas and offered to the Lord. And happy are the thousands of birds among the branches to greet him with joyful songs. Oh, the birds that all he always loved do not curse him. Even a small herd of sheep seem to be wishing to greet him, although they are sad, having been deprived of their little ones that have been sold for the Passover sacrifice. It is the lament of mothers resounding in the air, as they bleat, calling their little ones, that will never come back. And they come to rub against Jesus, looking at him with their meek eyes. The sight of the sheep reminds the apostles of the right, and when they were almost at Gethsemane, they asked Jesus, Where shall we go to consume the Passover? Which place are you choosing? Tell us, and we will go and prepare everything. And Judas of Kerioth says, Give me your orders, and I will go. Peter, John, listen to me. The two, who were a little ahead, approached Jesus, who has called them. Go ahead and enter the town by the dung gate. As soon as you go in, you will meet a man who is coming back from Enrogel with a pitcher of that good water. Follow him until he goes into a house. You will say to him who is in it. The master says, Where is the room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large supper room, which is ready. Prepare everything there. Go quickly, and then join us at the temple. The two go away in a hurry. Jesus, instead, proceeds slowly. The morning is still cool, and the only first pilgrims appear on the roads leading into town. They cross the little Kidron Bridge that is before Gethsemane and enter the town. The gates are no longer watched by legionaries, because, probably because of a counter-order by Pilate, who has been reassured by the lack of disputes concerning Jesus. There is, in fact, absolute tranquility everywhere. Oh, no one can deny that the Judeans have been able to control themselves. No one has molested the Master or his disciples, behaving respect, uh, respectfully, if not affectionately, and as well-mannered people. They have always greeted him, even the most rancorous members of the Sanhedrin, also, yesterday's reproof was borne with incomparable patience, and as Caiaphas's country house is close to that gate, just now a large group of Pharisees and scribes passes by coming from it, and among them there is the son of Annas with Helkai, Doris, and Sadok, and, bending their backs covered with wide mantles, they pay their respects among the fluttering of garments, fringes, and bulky headgear. Jesus greets them and passes by regal in his red woolen tunic and his mantle of a darker shade, the headgear of Syntyche in his hand, while the sun turns his copper-red hair into a golden wreath and a shining veil reaching down to his shoulders. 
After he has passed, the backs straighten up, and the faces appear, those of furious hyenas. Judas of Kerioth, who was always looking around with his treacherous face, moves to the roadside under the pretext of tying his sandal, and, I can see him very well, beckons to those men to wait for him. He lets the group of Jesus and his disciples go ahead, always busy at the buckle of his sandal to strike an attitude. He then passes quickly close to the scribes and Pharisees and whispers, At the beautiful gate, about the sixth hour, one of you, and he darts away quickly, joining his companions. Frank, impudently frank. They go up to the temple, only few Jews as yet, but many Gentiles. Jesus goes to worship the Lord. He then comes back and he tells Simon and Bartholomew to buy the lamb, getting the money from Judas of Kerioth. I could have done it, says Judas. You will have other things to do. You know that. There is that widow to whom the offering of Mary of Lazarus is to be taken, informing her that after the festivities she should go to Bethany, to Lazarus. Do you know where she lives? Have you understood? Yes, I know. Zacharias, who knows her well, showed me the place, and he adds, I am very glad to go, not so much because of the journey as because of the lamb. When have I to go? Later. I shall not stop long here. I will rest today as I want to be fit for this evening and for my night prayer. All right. Well, I wonder. Jesus, who in the past days has had said nothing about his intentions in order not to let Judas have any details, why does he now say, why does he repeat what he will do during the night? Has his passion already begun with the blindness of foresight, or has, his, or has this foresight increased so much that he can read in the books of heaven that that is the night, and that therefore it is necessary to make it known to him who is waiting to know, so that he may hand him over to his enemies? Or has he always known that his immolation is to begin that night? I cannot give any answer. Jesus does not give me any reply, and I remain in my queries while I watch Jesus, who is curing the last sick people, the last ones. Tomorrow, in a few hours, he will no longer be able. The earth will be bereft of its powerful healer of bodies, but the victim from his scaffold will begin the series, uninterrupted for twenty centuries, of his spiritual healings. Today, I am contemplating rather than describing. My Lord makes me project my spiritual sight from what I see happening in the last days of Christ's freedom to what it will be throughout ages. Today I am contemplating the feelings, the thoughts of the Master, rather than what is happening around him. I am already in the distressing understanding of his torture at Gethsemane. As usual, Jesus is overwhelmed by the crowd that has increased and consists now mainly of Hebrews, who forget to hasten to the place where lambs are sacrificed, anxious as they are to approach Jesus, the Lamb of God, who is about to be immolated. And the people go on asking questions, and they want further explanations. Many are Hebrews who have come from the Diaspora, and having heard people speak of the reputation of the Christ, of the Galilean prophet, of the Rabbi of Nazareth, they are curious to hear him speak, and are anxious to get rid of every possible doubt. And they push through the crowd, and they implore those from Palestine, saying, You always have him with you. You know who he is. You can hear his words whenever you wish. We have come from afar, and we shall be departing immediately after satisfying the precept. Let us go to him. The crowd gives way with difficulty to make room for them, and they approach Jesus and watch him with curiosity. They talk in low voices to one another, group by group. Jesus observes them, even if at the present time, even if at the same time he listens to a group of people who have come from Berea. Then, after dismissing the latter group of people who have given him money for the poor, as many people do, and he has handed it to Judas as usual, he begins to speak. You are all of the same religion, but of different places of origin, and many of those who are present here are wondering, who is this man who is called the Nazarene? And their hopes clash with their doubts. Listen. It is said of me, A shoot will spring from the stalk of Jesse. A flower will come from this root, and the Spirit of the Lord will rest upon him. He will not judge by what appears to the eyes. He will give no verdict on hearsay, but he will judge the wretched with integrity. He will take up the cudgels for the lowly. The shoot of the root of Jesse, placed as a signal among nations, will be implored by peoples, and his sepulchre will be glorious. After hoisting a flag for the nations, he will gather together the refugees of Israel. He will assemble the scattered people of Judah from the four corners of the earth. It is said of me, Here is the Lord God coming with power. His arm will triumph. He carries with him his prize, his work before his eyes. Like a shepherd, he will pasture his flock. It is said of me, Here is my servant with whom I will stay, in whom I del my soul delights. I have endowed him with my spirit. He will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout. He will not break the crushed reed. He will not put out the smoky wick. He will do justice according to truth, without being sad or turbulent. He will succeed in establishing justice on the earth, and the islands 
will await his law. It is said of me, I, the Lord, have called you in justice. I have taken you by the hand. I have preserved you. I have appointed you as covenant of the people and light of the nations, to open the eyes of the blind, to free captives from prison, and those who lie in darkness from the dungeon. It is said of me, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to announce the good news to the meek, to cure those whose hearts are broken, to preach liberty to slaves, freedom to prisoners, to preach the year of grace of the Lord. It is said of me, He is the strong one. He will feed his flock with the power of the Lord, with the majesty of the name of the Lord, his God. They will be converted to him, because as from now he will be glorified to the utmost limits of the world. It is said of me, I will go and look for my sheep, myself. I will look for the lost ones. I will bring back those that have been driven away. I will blind those with I will blind bind those with fractures. I will nourish the weak ones. I will watch over the ones that are fat and strong. I will pasture them with justice. It is said, he is the Prince of Peace, and will be the peace. It is said, Here comes your King, the Just One, the Savior. He is poor, he is riding a little donkey. He will announce peace to the nations. His dominion will be from sea to sea, to the utmost limits of the earth. It is said, Seventy weeks have been decreed for your people, for your holy city, so that prevarication may be removed, sin may come to an end, wickedness may be cancelled, eternal justice may come, Visions and prophecies may be fulfilled, and the Holy of Holies may be anointed. After 7 plus 62, the Christ will come. After 62, he will be killed. After one week, he will confirm the will, but in the middle of the week, victims and sacrifices will stop, and the abomination of desolation will be in the temple, and it will last until the end of time. So, will there be a shortage of victims in these days? Will the altar have no victim? It will have the great victim. Here the prophet sees it. Who is this coming with garments stained with crimson? He is handsome in his garment, and he marches in the fullness of his strength. And we, and he who is poor, how did he dye his garment with purple? Here the prophet explains it. I abandoned my body to those who struck me, my cheeks to those who tore at my beard. I did not turn my face away from those who insulted me. My handsomeness and my splendor were lost, and men no longer loved me. Men have despised me and considered me the last one, the man of sorrows. My face will be veiled and scorned, and they will regard me as a leper, whereas on behalf of everybody I shall be covered with sores and put to death. Here is the victim. Be not afraid, Israel. Be not afraid. The Passover lamb is not unavailable. Be not afraid, O earth. Be not afraid. Here is the Savior. Like a sheep he will be led to the slaughterhouse, because he wanted that, and he did not open his mouth to curse those who were killing him. After being condemned, he will be raised and consumed in pain, with his limbs dislocated, his bones uncovered, his feet and hands pierced. But after the anguish through which he will justify many, he will possess the multitudes, because, after delivering his life to death for the salvation of the world, he will rise from the dead and will rule the earth. He will nourish peoples with the water seen by Ezekiel, flowing out of the true temple that, even if it is knocked down, will rise again through its own strength. And with the vine by which also the snow-white garment of the spotless lamb has been dyed purple, and with the bread descended from heaven. You who are thirsty, come to the waters. You who are hungry, take your nourishment. You who are worn out, and you sick people, drink my wine. Come, you who have no money, and you who are in bad health, come. And you who are in darkness, and you who are dead, come. I am riches and health, I am light and life. Come, you who are looking for the way. Come, you who are seeking the truth. I am the way and truth. Do not be afraid of not being able to consume the lamb, because there are no really holy victims in this desecrated temple. You will all be able to eat of the Lamb of God, who has come to take away the sins of the world, as the last of the prophets of my people said, of me, of that people whom I ask, my people, what have I done to you? In what have I grieved you? What else could I have given you more than what I gave you? I taught your minds, I cured your sick people, I helped your poor people, I satisfied the hunger of your crowds, I loved you and your children, I forgave and prayed for you, I loved you to the extent of sacrifice. And what are you preparing for your Lord? One hour, the last one is given to you, my people, my regal and holy town. Come back in this hour to the Lord your God. He has spoken true words. That is what is said, and he really does what is said. Like a shepherd, he has taken care of everybody. As if you were stray sheep, sick, in darkness, he has come to lead us to the right way, to cure our souls and bodies, to enlighten us. All the peoples really go to him. 
Look over there at those Gentiles, how, they admi how, how admired they are. He has preached peace. He has given love. I do not understand what he says about the sacrifice. He speaks as if he had to be killed. It is so, if he is the man seen by the prophets, the Savior, and he speaks as if all the people had to ill-treat him. That will never happen. The people, we, love him. He is our friend. We will defend him. He is a Galilean, and we Galileans will give our lives for him. He is of David's stock, and we men of Judea will raise our hands to defend him. And we, whom he loved as he loved you, we from Haran, from Perea, from the Decapolis, shall we ever forget him? We will all defend him. These are the voices of the crowd, which by now is very numerous. How transient are human intentions. Judging by the position of the sun, I think it must be about 9 o'clock a.m. our time. Twenty-four hours later, these people will have been round the martyr for many hours to torture him with their hatred and blows, and shouting they will request his death. Few, very few, too few among the thousands of people who are crowding from every part of Palestine and farther away, and who have received light, health, wisdom, forgiveness from Christ, will be those who not only will not try to tear him away from his enemies, because their small number compared with the multitude of the strikers prevents them, but will not even be able to comfort him, giving him a proof of their love by following him with a friendly attitude. The praises, assents, and admired comments spread through the, through the large court like waves that from the open sea go far to die on the beach. Some scribes, Judeans, and Pharisees try to counteract the enthusiasm of the people as well as the ferment of the people against the enemies of the Christ, saying, He is raving, his tiredness is so great, and makes him delirious. He mistakes honors for persecutions. His words have torrents of his usual wisdom, but mixed with delirious sentences. No one wants to hurt him. We have understood. We have understood who he is. But the people are doubtful about such a great change of humor, and some rebel against them, saying, He cured my insane son. I know what madness is. One who is mad does not speak like that. And another one says, Let them say, They are vipers who are afraid that the club of the people may break their backs. They sing the sweet song of the nightingale in order to deceive us. But if you listen carefully, there is the hiss of the snake in it. And also another one, Sentries of the people of Christ, look out. When the enemy caresses, he has a dagger concealed in his sleeve, and he stretch it out, stretches out his hand to strike. Keep your eyes open and your hearts ready. Jackals cannot become meek lambs. You are right. The owl lures and enchants simple little birds with the immobility of its body and with the false joy of its greeting. It laughs and invites him with its cry, but it is ready to devour, and so forth, from group to group. But there are also some Gentiles who have been constant and more and more numerous in listening to the Master during the days of the festivity. They are always at the edge of the crowd because the Hebrew-Palestinian exclusivism is strong and repels them, pretending the place is closest to the Master, so they wish to approach him and speak to him. A large group of them casts glances of, at Philip, who has been pushed into a corner by the crowd. They approach him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus, your master, at close quarters, and speak to him at least once. Philip stands on the tips of his toes to see whether there is any apostle closer to the Lord. He sees Andrew, and after calling him, he shouts, There are some Gentiles here who would like to greet the master. Ask him whether he will receive them. Andrew, a few meters away from Jesus, squeezes, squeezed in the crowd, pushes his way through the crowd, working generously with his elbows, without regard, and shouting, Make way! Make way, I say! I must go to the master! He reaches him and informs him of the wish of the Gentiles. Take them to that corner. I will come to them. And while Jesus tries to pass through the crowd, John, who has just come back with Peter, struggles to make way for him, and is assisted in doing so by Peter, Judas Thaddeus, James of Zebedee, and Thomas, who leaves the group of his relatives that, he met, that met him in the crowd in order to help his companions. Jesus is where the Gentiles already are, and they greet him. Peace be with you. What do you want of me? To see you and speak to you. Your words have upset us. We have always been wanting to speak to you, to tell you that your word affects us. But we were waiting for a suitable moment to do so. Today, you are speaking of death. We are afraid that we shall not be able to speak to you any more if we do not take advantage of this hour. But is it possible that the Hebrews may kill their best son? We are Gentiles, and we have received no favor from you from your hand. Your word was unknown to us. We have heard people speak of you vaguely, but we had never seen you or approached you. And yet, as you can see, we pay homage to you. It is the whole world that honors you with us. Yes, the hour has come when the Son of Man is to be glorified by men and by spirits. Now the crowd is round Jesus again, once, once again, but with difference that the Gentiles are in, are in the first row and the others behind. But if it is the hour of your glorification, you will not die, as you say or as we have understood, because it is not a glorification to die in that way. 
How will you be able to gather the world under your scepter if you die before doing so? If your arm is immobilized by death, how will it be able to triumph and gather peoples together? By dying, I give life. By dying, I build. By dying, I create the new people. It is through sacrifice that one gains victory. I solemnly tell you that if the wheat grain that has fallen on the ground does not die, it remains unfruitful. If instead it dies, then it yields a rich harvest. He who loves his life will lose it. He who hates his life in this world will save it for the eternal life. It is my duty to die, to give this eternal life to all those who follow me to serve the truth. Let those who want to serve me come. The places in my kingdom are not limited to this or to that people. Let whoever wants to serve me come and follow me, and where I am. My servant will be there as well, and he who serves me will be honored by my Father, the only true God, the Lord of heaven and earth, the creator of everything that exists, the thought, word, love, life, way, truth, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, one being trine, trine being one, only true God. But now my soul is upset, and what shall I say? Shall I perhaps say, Father, save me from this hour? No, because I have come for this, to arrive at this hour. So I will say, Father, glorify your name. Jesus stretches out his arms crosswise, a purple cross against the white marbles of the porch, and he raises his head, offering himself, praying, ascending with his soul to the Father. And the voice, louder than thunder, immaterial inasmuch it is not like any human voice, but very sensible to all ears, fills the clear sky of the beautiful April day, and vibrates more powerful than the chord of a gigantic organ, in a very beautiful tonality, and proclaims, I have glorified him, and I will glorify him again. The people have been frightened. That voice, so powerful that the soil and what it was, what is on it vibrated because of it, that mysterious voice, different from any other, coming from an unknown source, that voice that fills everything from north to south, from east to west, terrorizes the Hebrews and amazes the heathens. The former, when possible, throw themselves on the ground, murmuring in their fear, We shall die now. We have heard the voice of heaven. An angel has spoken to him. And they beat their breasts, awaiting death. The latter shout, A peal of thunder, a rumbling roar. Let us run away. The earth has roared. It has quaked. But it is impossible to run away in the throng that increases with those who, who from outside the walls of the temple rush inside, shouting, Have mercy on us! Let us run! This is a holy place! The mountain where the altar of God rises will not split! So they all remain where they were, where the crowd and fear blocked them. Priests, scribes, Pharisees, Levites, magistrates, who were scattered in the meanders of the temple, rush to its terraces. They are excited and dumbfounded. But of all of them, only Gamaliel with his son comes down from among the peoples in the court. Jesus sees him passing by, all white in his linen garment, which is so white that it gleams, even the strong sun shining on it. Jesus, looking at Gamaliel, but as if, as if he were speaking to everybody, raises his voice, saying, Not for me, but for you, has this voice come from heaven. Gamaliel stops, turns round, and with the glance, glances of his very deep, dark eyes, which the habit of being a master, worshipped like a demigod, has un involuntarily made as hard as those of predators, he pierces through the sapphire, limpid, majestically mild eyes of Jesus. And Jesus resumes, The judgment of this world takes place now. Now the prince of darkness is about to be driven out. And when I have been lifted up, I will draw everybody to myself, because that is how the Son of Man will save. We have learnt from the books of the law that the Christ lives forever, and you say that you are the Christ, and you say that you must die. And you also say that you are the Son of Man, and that you will save, being lifted up. So who are you, the Son of Man, or the Christ? And who is the Son of Man? asked the crowds, who are taking heart again. There are only one person. Open your eyes to the light. Only for a short time the light will still be with you. Walk towards the truth while you still have the light among you, and that you not, may not be overtaken by darkness. Those who walk in darkness do not know where they will end up. While you have the light among you, believe in it, to be the children of the light. He becomes silent. The crowd is perplexed and divided. Some go away, shaking their heads, so much the attitude of the main dignitaries, Pharisees, chiefs of the priests, scribes, and particularly of Gamaliel, and they regulate their conduct on that attitude. And others nod assent and bow to Jesus, clearly meaning, We believe, we honor you for what you are. But they dare not side openly with him. They are afraid of the vigilant eyes of Christ's enemies, of the mighty ones who are watching them from the high terraces dominating the splendid porches surrounding the courts of the temple. Also Gamaliel, after remaining pensive for some minutes, and 
he seems to be questioning the marbles of the pavement for answers to his inward questions, sets out again towards the ex exit after shaking his head and shoulders, as if to express disappointment or scorn, and he passes straight in front of Jesus without looking at him any more. Jesus, instead, looks at him compassionately, and he raises his voice again very loudly. It sounds like the blare of a trumpet to overcome every noise and be heard by the great scribe who is going away disappointed. He seems to be speaking to everybody, but it is clear that he is speaking for him alone. He says in a very loud voice, He who believes in me does not really believe in me, but in him who sent me. And he who sees me sees him who sent me. And he is indeed the God of Israel, because there is no other God but he. That is why I say, if you cannot believe in me as the man who is said to be the son of Joseph of David and the son of Mary, of the stock of David, of the virgin seen by the prophet born at Bethlehem, as is announced by the prophecies preceded by the Baptist, as also has been said for ages, believe at least the voice of your God who has spoken to you from heaven. Believe in me as the son of this God of Israel, because if you do not believe in him who has spoken to you from heaven, you do not offend me, but your God whose son I am. Do not remain in darkness. I have come as light to the world, so that he who believes in me may not remain in darkness. Do not create remorses for yourselves, as you might not be able to appease your minds when I have gone back whence I came, and they would be a severe punishment of God for your stubbornness. I am willing to forgive while I am among you, until judgment is past, and as far as I am concerned, I wish to forgive. But the mind of the Father is different from mine, because I am mercy, and he is justice. I solemnly tell you that if a man listens to my words and does not comply with them, I will not judge him. I did not come to I did not come to the world to judge, but to save it. But if I do not judge, I solemnly tell you that there is who will judge you by your actions. My Father, who sent me, will judge those who reject his word. Yes, he who does not despise me and does not acknowledge the word of God. Yes, he who despises me and does not acknowledge the word of God and does not receive the words of the uh, the words of the word well, he has who will judge him. The very word that I have announced will judge him on the last day. It is said, God is not to be scoffed at, and the God scoffed at will be terrible with those who consider him mad and mendacious. Bear in mind, all of you, that the words you hear me utter come from God, because I have not spoken on my own account, but the Father who sent me prescribed that I must say what I must say and of what I have to speak, and I obey his order, because I know that his commandment is just. Each command of God is eternal life, and I, your master, set you for you the example of obedience to all the commands of God. You may rest assured that the things I told you and I am telling you, I said them and I am saying them as my father told me to say them to you. And my father is the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the God of Moses, of the patriarchs and of the prophets, the God of Israel, your God. Words of light that fall into the darkness that is already growing darker in hearts. Gamaliel, who had stopped once again, his head bowed, resumes walking. Others follow him, shaking their heads or sneering. Jesus also goes away. But first he says to Judas, Go where you have to go. And to the others, Each of you is free to go where you have or 